Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, and uh, I'm presenting uh, this conversation I had with Ed Pisker, who uh, sadly took his own life um, over the weekend. And, um, man, it's it's really sad. Um, I'm not excusing uh, the behavior that Ed was um, accused of. I don't think it was worth um, him uh, becoming ruined and sacrificing his life as he did. I'm, I'm very sorry to uh, know this and be aware of this. Mental health is a very serious issue, and uh, I can only echo those who uh, point to the fact that uh, if you know somebody that is uh, really that down, do anything you can to help them seek help. Um, Ed is a very, uh, was a very unique uh, voice in comics, and I don't think that should be ignored. And um, I uh, was a fan from first becoming aware of his work with Hip Hop Family Tree. Um, I was in uh, a conversation with Ed as recently as um, the end of the year, trying to help him uh, make an appearance at a convention that I helped uh, get people involved in. It ended up not happening, but Ed uh, was always uh, very kind to me. And uh, Cartoonist Kayfabe, his wonderful YouTube channel that he had with uh, Jim Rugg, uh, was a fantastic um, source for comic book uh, critique, history, information. He and uh, Jim had wonderful interviews with some of the top creators in the business and could bring that artist's perspective in his interviews. And uh, I never felt uh, like I was in competition with Ed and Jim. I always felt that we were uh, kindred spirits when it came to wanting to cover uh, the current comic scene and comic book history. Um, not much else to say other than uh, I- I'm sad. And, uh, and again, I-, I think Ed was a nice acquaintance. I- I'm sorry for some of the choices that he made in his personal life, and I'm sorry that they contributed to his uh, untimely demise. With that said, I'm presenting um, this conversation, my first conversation with Ed, about uh, his uh, body of work in Hip Hop Family Tree that is significant. I hope it lives on. I hope uh, that this cancel culture environment that we live in does not negate the positive work that Ed did. I think um, presenting the history of hip hop as he did in comic book form online and in his volumes of uh, comics uh, is a valuable resource of uh, comic books and also, again, the history of hip-hop music. And um, what else can I say other than uh, Ed Pisker, Reskin in Peace? And uh, without further ado and without further commercials, I present uh, this conversation I had with Ed uh, back uh, about 10 years ago. Pretty amazing. Um, so here it is now on Word Balloon. Ed Piscor, welcome to Word Balloon. It's a it's a pleasure to talk to you, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. You've got over ten years in in comics. Tell me about some other uh, big creators that you worked with in the past. Uh, well, I, I sort of broke into comics uh, by working with Harvey Picar on American Splendor strips. That was, uh, you know, like eleven years ago when I was twenty one, and um, wow, he was at the height of his popularity, which was which made it even crazier when he gave me that phone call. You know, because he was. You know, just off of Sundance and all of that stuff f- with the American Splendor movie. So I did some strips with him, and then which led to Harvey and I doing a few complete books together. Which books? Uh, we did a book called uh, Macedonia, and another book called The Beats about the Beat I- Generation. Indeed, and I remember The Beats, and I enjoyed that book very well. Absolutely, man. That was uh, your uh, your guys kind of. Uh, biographies uh, of uh, the Beat Generation poets. Right. That's excellent. Well, how did Harvey find you? I, um, like the, in like early 2000s and before, uh, what you would do is you would draw your comic strips and then you would send them to like the five gatekeepers who existed, which would be the different publishers. They each had their own anthology series or something. So you would send comics to Fanographics or Slave Labor, Drawn in Quarterly, Top Shelf, and... You know, if they said no, then you just had to throw that comic away and, uh, you know, go on to the next. So I, I sort of didn't, didn't like that idea. What I what I did was I took all these comics I drew that were rejected 
and I sent them copies of them to the different creators who I liked just just for po- some possible feedback or something like that. And Harvey was one of the guys who I, I sent work to, man. I, I looked at a lot of the guys who drew comics for him, and I thought they were all pretty crappy. So I'm like, well, I bet, like, I, I, bet I could get in here somehow. <laughs> I can't be as bad as these guys. I can do better than them. Yeah, some, some of them. Um, That's what I, I was going to say, yeah. So have you, have you met some other uh, PCAR collaborators since? Oh, for sure, man. For sure, yeah. And, um, you know, good people. Um, but you know, Harvey did call, so so uh, okay. he must have felt the same way. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I really enjoyed the beats, man. I'm glad to talk to you. I meant to talk to Harvey about that before he passed away. I uh, I had uh, just got uh, Word Balloon going. Uh, beats came out what oh five oh six? Yeah, somewhere around there. I, I was 23 year, years old when I when I did that one, and. Um, you know, I'll be honest. I, I I didn't have much of a relationship with the material. I like I don't I don't think too much about about the that generation of writers or anything like that. It was a it was a commercial decision for me. Um, okay. I, I was very excited at being a, a kid whose job was drawing comics. Like that's how I made my money. And you know, I had a bunch of friends here in Pittsburgh who who made comics too, mm-hmm. and. And none of them made a dollar at that point. And I'm like, hey, man, I think these guys are doing it wrong. And, and so I said yes to the gig with Harv, but it was, you know, just a commercial thing to, to make money. Like I wasn't – didn't have my heart set on, uh, you know, making that comic happen or anything. Did it at all inspire what you're doing now with uh, Hip Hop Family Tree? It, it did. Um, not, you know, sort of the, the way that I structured this, the narratives um, – take inspiration from the way Harvey and I put that Beats comic together. Um, some of the examples are just how the storytelling is laid out on each page, where from one panel to the next, um, there could be, like, huge gaps in, in time that, that transpire in between each panel, you know? So, so there could be years in between one panel to the next. So you got to choose the exact perfect moments, and you have to concisely describe that with this moment in time or whatever and and that's some of the stuff that I pulled from from Harvey. Man, I'll tell you, I uh, this you know, I was a, a kid when all this was happening and so I, I find it fascinating as well because I really came to the history of hip hop in the most mainstream radio sort of way. What intrigued you about doing this history? Uh, well, you know, I was I was born born in an urban environment with um, where, where hip hop was all over the place in the '80s. Certainly, by the time I was like five or six, you could just see and hear rap music everywhere. Um, sure. And so it was always a part of my life. I always liked the records, um, and I have a love of the the trivia of, of hip hop as well. Like I, I just uh, I can read incessantly about the subject. So I just I figured. Like I'm the cartoonist with the most information, like with the most knowledge about this this uh, this culture. Mm-hmm. So I should be the guy to make the comic about it. It's a extremely fun thing to do. If 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 nothing else, I I think that um, people can see my enthusiasm on on the page. I love it. I love uh, your style of art, and also the irony that a silent art form is chronicling this sound medium yeah my uh the way that i describe the comic it's almost only tangentially about rap music in a way the the, where my mind is uh when putting the comics together is in world building and community building uh documenting a story about the growth of a culture uh the culture happens to be rap music and there are certainly plenty enough panels where there are people in clubs dancing and singing but it's really about how this person met this person to make this thing happen mm-hmm. and just a continuous series of those things which will which start in the you know tenement buildings of the South Bronx and then it's just going to keep expanding and getting bigger and bigger and bigger um it's a it's a really fun kind of puzzle to put together you've uh, sent me two issues has issue two come out yet yeah it came out in uh, august okay these are from fanographics and i should say right off the bat if people haven't seen them 
they are Treasury Edition size comics, correct? Yeah, Treasury Edition being the uh, the 1970s, early 80s, over oversized, gigantic Marvel uh, comics that would that would collect all the quintessential you know Spider-Man stories or Fantastic sure. Four stories. Yeah, um, the the format choice. Um, was crucial because I wanted it to be indicative of the time that my stories take place. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, and that format, you know, was a was a big deal in like the late seventies, early eighties. Man, I, I, is it the uh, Rock and the Casbah uh, uh, music video? Man, where where you see the Clash holding the Dick Tracy uh, oversized uh, <laughs> comic? You're right. I forgot about that. That's fantastic, man. Yeah. That's hilarious, uh, especially given that I remember watching that video when it first came out. Remember buying that comic when it first came out. So that's hilarious, and that's what I like about your history too. Is that there are what at least on the surface seem to be unlikely circles of of people meeting people. One of my the biggest discoveries that I've uncovered for for myself. This could be common knowledge for other people. And I certainly don't claim to be an expert. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a student as well as anybody uh, of, of hip hop and comics and stuff. Um, but one of the biggest things that I've discovered for myself while putting the, the comics together was the importance of the downtown kind of bourgeois Manhattan art scene. Um, the importance that it had on the proliferation of hip hop, because through many sources that I've uh, you know uncovered. Um, a lot of people basically say that hip hop would have died out in the early 80s, like right after the first records started coming out, because the goal was never to play in parks and rec rooms and stuff. They wanted to play in like nightclubs. And so, so hip hop was growing up and like go, trying to become like the, uh, the disco scene in a way. But people like Debbie Harry, and Fab Five Freddy and uh-huh. and uh, different people in the art world brought hip hoppers down to Manhattan to play in art shows and you know to play with Blondie and, and and things like that and that put put these hip hoppers in a place where where um, the mass media could easily you know like somebody from Time Magazine could just walk across the str- the street to a gallery and see it happen rather than you know travel to the big scary uptown Bronx scene sure so so uh, yeah like the, the the art world the punk world was like a crucial part of the growth of hip hop for better or worse well I, I I think for better well and in terms of obviously from from the art standpoint um, that's what I like about this story because man, Debbie Harry uh, and I, I kind of remember again some of these scenes that you play out like Hugh Downs interviewing Debbie Harry on 2020 after Rapture came out. And she really, like, kind of brokered with Rapture. It's interesting to see all these steps that kind of had to happen for mainstream awareness uh, beyond that original scene. Yeah, she brought she brought uh, the Funky 4 Plus 1 uh, to, to be the musical performers uh, the night that she hosted Saturday Night Live. And something really cool that happened recently, uh, I was a... I was a guest at um, a convention called Ape, the Alternative Press Expo in San Francisco, sure. mm-hmm. and Blondie was playing out in San Fran uh, that same weekend that I, that I was out there. So we had a uh, we had a hip hop family tree uh, book signing dance party at a store called Isotope Comics, and and uh, and uh, Bl- uh, Debbie Harry and Chris Stein from Blondie they ended up gr- getting uh, copies of. The box set, which was which is pretty freaking cool. <laughs> That's fantastic. So the box set's the two issues, right? Yeah, it's two issues plus the plus there is this this ash can mini comic that that I have uh, as like a bonus ma- piece of material. It's like it's an ash can that's cardstock, foil embossed, gold. Uh, you know every kind of like '90s trope, and it's a story about how Rob Liefeld has intersected with with hip hop over. You know various stages from the Spike Lee uh, jeans commercial to his uh, small association with Easy E, and I and I drew it in Rob Liefeld's style. <laughs> That's fantastic, and it doesn't surprise me that uh, uh, James Stein from Isotope uh, didn't get involved in this, and uh, 
uh, made that little happening happen at Isotope. So that that makes a lot of sense. Very cool, man. That uh, Debbie and Chris were able to, uh, you know, get to see your stuff. So did they flip through it? Did you see them uh, react to the the book right there? No, I did not, man. And I, uh, I I'm, I'm very happy about that. There's a strip that runs in Chicago, uh, in the Illinois Entertainer, that uh, focuses on the history of Chicago music, and it's done in a one page. Like Prince Valiant, Hal Foster used to each week, but it was monthly. And uh, and and your books remind me of of that. Is this the only you know rap history in comic form that you're aware of? Um, yeah, I guess I like there were those rock and roll comics. You remember that company from sure. a million years ago? Um, <laughs> but but the, all those comics, you could tell that the people who made those comics didn't give a crap about the subject matter. So <laughs> like they they were using that as a kind of a portfolio piece to try to get an opportunity to to draw Spider-Man or something and I, I clearly remember that the Public Enemy one was drawn by Stuart Immonen, uh who went on to do Superman and things like that Yeah, we've talked about that on this show Absolutely. Yeah, um, so there's that stuff and then you have the weird comics that you know, you could tell that rappers grew up on comics, so the, now they bought it. They ha- they have a name for themselves, so they decided to like put their name on a comic or, or you know, quote unquote, write a comic. Uh, so then you have these things where it's like Method Man fighting zombies, or the Wu Tang Clan is an actual like ninja family or something like that. And you know, all that stuff is so cheesy and crappy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> there's, there's that new one with DMC as a superhero man, which is kind of corny. I think this is an excellent story. Where have you gone for your research? You say you're a big trivia buff on this. Where'd your information come from? Yeah, it came from every resource I could I could find, from documentaries to uh, to interviews that I found online or in magazines to magazine articles to some of the bigger books that were that were written about the subject. Um, podcast interviews. The the the, the new one that's going to be like the biggest. Uh, resource for me is this podcast called the combat jack show because this guy is interviewing uh all of these uh golden age rappers from like the 80s and he's asking all the right questions like literally literally every question i have in my mind this interviewer is asking so that's going to be great my information comes from every place i could i could find it really are there any legal pitfalls? Because, you know, I mean, again, you're telling the story, like you said, of people meeting people and how it happened. But, like, you know, do you have to obviously watch in terms of, I would imagine, you know, not only uh, song snatches, but lyrics, obviously, are copywritten and everything. So Yeah, I, like, I'll be honest. Like, I literally don't know. Um, you know, I started, I started and I continue doing these strips on a website called Boing Boing each week. Every mm-hmm. Tuesday sure. I put up a new one. Okay. And when I started it, I had no idea if what I was doing was illegal. And then I got Planet Gra- Graphics to publish my comics, and I still didn't know if what I was doing was illegal. So so uh, I haven't been slapped with a lawsuit yet or anything like that, and it's been two years. So maybe I won't be. Uh, so, so, so basically, I, I just don't know. And, and I can tell you that like the hip-hop and rap music that I know and love uh, definitely was kind of destroyed by lawyers and copyright and things like that because my favorite rap music comes from um, sampling old records and using old drum breaks and stuff like that. So, like, the hip-hop that I love, the rap music that I uh, adore most, you know, basically had to stop existing in the early to mid-'90s right. um, for those very reasons. So, like, you know, it would... It would suck if, uh, you know, some douchey lawyers um, would, like, prevent me from, like, doing this thing. But, you know, we'll see. I I think you're staying on the right side, though, because, again, you're really just telling, like, mostly the the stories of how these people met. And I don't really see, you know, uh, like, like any any long passages of of anything that would exceed, you know, fair use. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, classic comics doing, you know, an Abe Lincoln comic or something like that. Or even now we see Blue Water and other uh, other companies kind of doing biographical comics and stuff. All the warts and the highlights and also just the interesting facts of how this went from being a live art form to recorded music and really a movement in music history. I think it's fascinating and I think you're doing... Uh, a great job of telling a lot of the stories that a lot of us didn't know about. Yeah, thanks. I I appreciate it. And and 
one of the ways I describe the work too is is that um, you know it, it's like the biography of hip hop rather than any rapper or anything like so like there are like hundreds of mini biographies that that will s- s- like that sprawl through the story that I'm telling but the the main character uh, is the is the culture of hip hop. Do you have this mapped out? Do you do you know I mean do you do you like how many issues do you see this going? Well, I'm I'm signed up for 6. Okay. And um well beyond the halfway point of book 3 right now. You know, like history has has mapped it out for me. Like what I um I'm basically sharing like what's been going on in my head for years and years and years because <laughs> because this because this culture does come from such a congested confined small area which means that everybody involved in that early scene was involved with each other. Mm-hmm. So I could play the six degrees of separation game and take you back to Cool Herc with almost anybody, man. Like any almost anybody that I that I know whose work I know, you know. Um so so I could play that game anyhow, and now I'm just illustrating, you know, all of these relationships to show you like like there's not a wasted page, so if if I'm showing you something, it's going to lead to something else. I think I think that the work begs uh, rereading rereading uh, after after you know you, you check it out for the first time because then you're going to see you're going to see like earlier kind of foreshadowing things that um you know show you future connections and then I want it to work just for just for anybody any reader but a hip hop reader will have like an extra insight to like uh oh I, I see where this is going and it you know kind of excites people that way understood and no i i'll tell you what i uh i i likely will want to talk to you again because i really feel like a novice kind of like pouring through this stuff even though i recognize a lot of names and you know i mean russell simmons is there ll cool j sylvia robinson and people like that uh you know grandmaster flash and jazzy jeff and i you know i mean that's the thing man i mean I, I again, you'll. Uh, I, I'm going to say it from a white guy, you know, a white kid uh, suburban mall perspective and everything. This is what was coming through the transom of my life and everything. And I was more of a rocker and stuff. But I mean, I, I you know, certainly appreciated Rapper's Delight when it came out. And now I have a newfound appreciation for it, given uh, what I read in uh, issue one. What kind of reaction did you get at Ape? Did you know uh, how hip is the? Uh, reactions it shows in it ape and stuff like that how are things going oh awesome yeah i mean it sells out routinely like it like Excellent. like the next time like the next show i do that it doesn't sell out i might i might uh feel bad on the inside man because i'm like getting so used to going home with um you know not having to worry about lugging any books back or anything like that <laughs> That's fantastic. You mentioned uh, the Pittsburgh uh, comics community. I know it's a good community. I like Jim Rugg and Dave Wachter, for example. Do you know those guys? Oh, for sure, yeah. And then there's Tom Scioli, who does uh, G.I. Joe vs. Transformers. Absolutely. I love Tom. I, I love uh, Godland, what he was doing with uh, Joe Casey. Oh God, Man of, yeah, Joe Casey, Man of Action. Absolutely, man. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. And then there's uh, a friend, Frank Santoro, who um, who's deeply involved in like the, the um, art comics movement. He, he had this book called Pompeii that came out from a picture box last year and he's a homie and um you know there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of people and there's a center for cartoon studies in in white river junction um vermont and they a lot of kids like graduate from there and then they come to pittsburgh because it's pretty cheap to live here and everything so we have a we have a good scene we have uh we have three or four great shops that we basically you could get you could get any comic that you want at you know at one of these several shops so uh yeah it's very cool and you've got uh beyond the story itself you've got tons of pinups i'd let you uh, rattle off some of some of the people that are represented in here i see michelle fife right away but uh tell me some of the others that you've got uh, doing pinups for you in the back yeah no problem it, it's like uh you know in in rap terms these are these are my guest mcs <laughs> uh so there are um, pinups in there by uh, Jim Mafu did in Africa Bambata. Um, Jim Rugg did Vanilla Ice, which was bonkers. Scott Morse did Public Enemy. Uh, my homegirl Katie Skelly did Debbie Harry. Um, awesome. Yeah, I, I get uh, there are ten pinups in each book, and everybody hits a home run on them too. Uh, you know, the first book I asked sort of my my closest comic friends, uh, and then once that book came out. 
a ton of my acquaintances were like, hey, man, why didn't you ask me to do a pinup? And I'm like, hey, man, please, by all means, do a pinup. I will put it in the thing. So I'm, like, booked up for the next six issues, um, you know, expecting very cool pinups from, from lots of cool people. Who did the Public Enemy Marvel cover? Uh, that was Scott Morse. Excellent. Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's That's very funny. His stuff is awesome. And, and then Chuck D got a hold of that. It, it was actually – it was really cool because that thing, when Scott posted it and uh, – it just got you know retweeted to death, and the first the first like big guy to retweet it was Arsenio Hall, <laughs> and then and then Chuck D got a hold of it, and 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 wow. the thing just went went gangbusters. That's fantastic. That's terrific. I always tell the guys, everybody who who draws a pinup, I'm like, be choosy and careful with who you decide to do a pinup on because because. It's like magic. Like you're going to draw them, and then these people will, will materialize in your life, and you know that could be that could be good or bad depending on who, on who you're doing. You know, sure. You can be careful uh, choosing to do a Shug Knight pinup or something, for example. I love the Curtis Blow Jared Williams piece. That's fantastic. Yeah, Jared's my man, and, and his comic Super Pro KO is is uh, definitely worth reading. I'm looking at uh, Jason Lex. Yeah, he's another Pittsburgh homie who uh, he he sort of came up with with Jim Rugg. They went to the same college and everything like that. And, and the, both of those dudes are like my big bros, you know. Like I like I've been hanging out with them since I started. So they were like crusty old men to me when they were twenty seven and I was like twenty one. <laughs> and and uh, you know we just uh, kept in touch. The cool thing about knowing all these dudes uh, personally is I you know it just helped my work grow. Over over the years, probably faster than it would have uh, just by my lonesome. I can appreciate that. Cold face killer with Matt Boris, very cool. Yeah, man, and Matt's another. Like I, I sort of came up with him as well, and and uh, you know the fact that he almost got a Pulitzer Prize last year. You know, he is like one or two away from getting it. Just just blows my mind. It's like I remember when we were young scrubs. <laughs> So are you, you know, you, you mentioned uh, the happening that was at uh, Isotope and everything. And I know Mafood has done great, like, art and music kind of parties. I imagine you have, too, with some of your stuff, where you've got, you know, DJ spinning and you're putting your guys' art on the walls. Or you guys might even be doing live art uh, parties as well. Yeah, like, I don't, I don't really get into that stuff too much. I get a little gun shy, uh, like, doing like doing stuff live in, in front of people or whatever. But, um, you know, just generally, the uh, me, me and my friends like we, we throw parties in town all the time and and uh, I hang out with the the this hardcore local breakdance group um, but but there's you know we rarely marry marry the two would you do any sort of party where you would play the music and and maybe show some of your panels and stuff and and, and, and do it that way where you show them on a screen you know you wouldn't have to do it live yeah you know it's never crossed my mind yeah uh, like like I'm I'm basically just a cartoonist so like my mind is focused on doing comics, and then I, you know, eventually, like I'll, I'll die of a nice old age peacefully. <laughs> but like, you know, my biggest uh, aspirations are to just, you know, be able to keep a roof over my head while while doing my comics. You've got so many labels and so many artists. It's it's the same problem that I know uh, documentarians have sometimes that they can make something. But then any sort of aftermarket immediately gets squashed because, you know, all all image, you know, video images and, and sound is copywritten left to right. You know, it would be great to see uh, some of the record companies that, you know, and or even the artists, if they've still got the rights to their own music, you know, to, to kind of get with you and, and uh, you know, see some sort of multimedia combination of your art and their music and everything. Put together. They're, they're, I'm very choosy because um, because I get offers – routinely um but i think even today like i got a pretty cool offer that i'm very excited about and you know it's with like a f- one of my favorite rappers um so you know more on that later but but uh okay but they they know about the book they dig it i get crazy phone calls every now and again from people <laughs> i would never expect uh and uh so, but I, but like I, like I am choosy because, man, some of these guys have just the, the crappiest ideas for me, man. Or it's just like oh, I'm not going to do that. Like that sounds so cheesy. 
I can understand that. Yeah, they want to be a superhero, and I'm sure they want to go back in time, and they want to do something crazy. Like, how many of them ha- have you gotten? And again, you don't need to go into detail, but have you gotten anyone who's like, hey, tell our story? I mean, you could be the behind the music in comic form of hip-hop. I mean, you already are, essentially. I mean, that's what you are doing. But, you know, uh, you, you could obviously there are other avenues maybe and other, other bands or other other artists and stuff that may want, you know, has anyone approached you about telling their story? Yeah, for sure. Like like most of the people that, that get in touch, uh, the, the proviso of the conversation is basically, uh, you know, when you get to my part, make sure you call me so that like I so that you do it right. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but what I've been discovering is that when these times come around or when I do just like speak to people who come later, like they are very hyperbolic about their situation and they sometimes try to try to sabotage other co- common wisdom in history. So it's almost uh, useless in a way where it's just like I can't vet the material. This sounds so outrageous. OK. Um, you know, I it, it, like if I put this in a thing like I'm officially slandering somebody else. So it's just like okay. Uh, you know, it's cool to talk to him, but, you know, it's a good thing I'm as old as I am now because if I was, you know, just like 21 doing this and I would have like, you know, I would be excited and have some kind of hero worship or something like that. And I'd be like, oh, yes, I'll, I'll be sure to do, do just that. <laughs> and it would just be a big piece of junk. Sure. Well, that, I, I get it. So what you're saying is, yeah, they're trying to rewrite their history and obviously make themselves – uh, put themselves in the best light possible, and and in some cases, obviously, maybe slandering somebody in the process, or really, you know, rewriting the facts. Frankly, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Interesting, man. Yeah. Crazy. That's hip. That's so, hip hop, though. It's like it's like uh, yeah. it's like you know, psychological warfare is a part of hip hop, man. Like when it comes to rap babbling and stuff, you got to get in the other dude's head, and and uh, you know, I get it. I get it, and then and then the hyperbole of hip hop, you know. So like these dudes are like really pumping themselves up, and, and you know it's no different than some of the lyrics where they're talking about like you know I got a color TV so I could see the Knicks play basketball. It's like you know in 1975 you didn't have a color TV. Quit lying. <laughs> Did uh, I think of Fred Van Lente and Ryan Dunleavy doing uh, their history of comic books and IDW? Do you know those guys at all? Uh, no, I do not. Well, I just wondered because, you know, they did the history of comics in comic book form. And like I said, you did your book, The Beats with Harvey. Have you talked to any other comic book people that have done histories uh, and how they've approached it? I've, I've not. And I, I actually um, I actually think that like a lot of that stuff is is um, junk, to be honest. Like the reason why like I'm doing like I'm like, OK, well, let, let me let me do a good one. Right. Because I don't think. I've, I've seen it done. I, I also don't like biopics either, by the way. Like, so, so I'm like doing this thing that I'm associated with it. So a lot of people have a preconceived notion that I'm into that kind of thing. When, when I, in fact, I think a lot of like um, nonfiction comics that people do, they're just like money grabs. Um, okay. They don't have much real investment in or enthusiasm in the um, subject matter. Like, so it's just like okay, like let, I'll show you guys what it looks like when somebody's very, very excited about this, like the subject matter, and, and um, you know it's fully uncompromised. There's no, there's no uh, editor in New York City who doesn't know anything about the subject matter, like telling me what to do. You know, uh, in the '90s, uh, there were a series of books that Piranha Press put out, uh, an imprint of DC, sure. and, they're, and they're the Big Book of Conspiracies, the Big Book of Lies, the Big Book of Crime. Buddies of mine like Hillary Barta have been cartoonists in, in books like that. I don't, are you aware of those books at all? Because, again, I, I think formatically uh, what you're doing reminds me of those books in the best possible way. I agree with you on a lot of those rock and roll uh, late 80s and 90s comics that really did suck. And there's a lot of current product that I'm not crazy about either as far as biographical comics. But they seem to like kind of do it the, the way you do. But, yeah, I just see a kinship with those books. I don't know if you were aware of those. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I I, uh, I had interest in those. But, but you know, once again, um, there were a few of those. Like, was there was, a, I think, a big book of freaks. And, and that one was, I, I think, written by, or maybe he just did an introduction, but this dude, Ricky J, who, who actually cares about the subject. But, like... Yeah, Ricky J from, I know him, he's the Chicago guy, David Mamet guy, the, uh, magi- the magician and con man, and sometimes... Uh, Movie did, did, did he did he uh, write that whole book or did he just do the intro? I, I just I think he 
I'm pretty sure he just did the end. Okay, okay, never mind. And never mind then, because what I was going to say is, if if he did write it, um, then you know it's obviously a guy very interested in the subject matter because those big books, um, you know, when I was a kid, like when I was eighteen, nineteen, like that was that was your wedge to break into um, DC Comics. It's like it's like that's where you would get like your foot in the door. So like you know you would get like a two page story to to illustrate or something like that. Um, so what I'm saying is like those guys like they they weren't necessarily that involved with the with the subject matter. Like like I'm I'm like so steeped in this that um that there really couldn't be another cartoonist to really lay like, handle it, man. Like like you know, it's, as ridiculous as that may may sound. Understood. And and speaking of forwards and stuff, you had a you had a nice uh forward written for you for volume two. Good introduction. Yeah, um, in volume two, uh, several pages are devoted, like about a dozen pages are devoted to this movie called Wild Style, which is which is a very important uh, piece of hip hop history. It's really like the first uh, the first kind of uh, popular um, place where where you break dancing, DJ, graffiti, like MCing, were all put under the same umbrella of one culture. Um, and, and the movie frankly is, is, is freaking awesome. Uh, so the director, Charlie Ahern, um, was, was goodly enough to, uh, to write an awesome introduction to, uh, to my book. And, and when I, um, when I had my, uh, my, uh, New York, uh, uh, release party for hip hop Two, Charlie came through and it was, uh, it was a great, it was a great, uh, great night. When did Volume One come out? You say Volume Two came out in August. Yeah, uh, Volume One came out like in December of last year, and believe it or not, my comic was a victim of uh, that government shutdown because, like, you remember when that thing happened? And, and yes, go on. so my books hit, hit, you know, U.S. shores, but one of the major. Uh, things that got hit, one of the major sort of administrations that got hit in the government was customs. Like, they had to downsize a lot during that period, so they just didn't get to the tin can that had the hip-hop comics, man. So, I was booked for all this travel, and I went to a lot of stuff with no books, um, because they were so slow. I mean, it took a month and a half for for them to to get out of customs, um, but the cool thing was that it it built this extra month 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 worth of anticipation. Um, so when the book came out, it literally sold out in two days. It came, you know came out on its normal Wednesday, like every other comic. And on Friday, we got a call from the distributor said, "Man, you better you better push the button to make more books happen, man, because we're out." Wow! Yeah, it was real cool. And then when we got the reprints, it took eight days for for them to sell out. That's fantastic! Yeah. Wonderful, Ed. That's that's really great, man. Are you? Do you have a day job right now, or are you able to do comics full time? No, I've I've, uh, I've been making comics full time for us, you know, for like these these eleven years, man. I excellent. Like, uh, well, I can't say that because uh, you know, for like a year and a half, I uh, I designed a, an adult an adult swim cartoon that you know yeah. I'm still sort of living off of, so. That's fantastic. That doesn't suck. Yeah, tell me what Adult Swim cartoon that was, man. Uh, it was called it was called Mongo Wrestling Alliance. It only lasted one season, and I designed the characters and did some art for it. But um, really awesome cartoonist who I who I owe everything to for for that gig is um, is Peter Bag who did a comic called Hate. Absolutely, um, sure. He put my name in the hat, and those guys called me, and uh, so like I was sort of out of comics for a year, but. It cre- it gave me the capital to um to just take time for myself to like before Hip Hop Family Tree I finished a book uh, for Top Shelf called WYSIWYG. Uh so like I was able to finish that book and put that out and then parlay that into the hip hop thing and, and the hip hop thing is like gangbusters right now so like yeah like it's it's good. That's excellent. Yeah, tell me about the alternative market. I'm going to call it the alternative market. You'll forgive me. Because it is just comics, but you know it's it seems to me that more stores, and again, I can only give mostly the Chicago perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, Chicago's always been a great city, and, and I mean, 
all my favorite stores uh, stock up the alternative stuff right next to the superhero stuff. And certainly we're seeing a big push in uh, regular fiction uh, genres, you know, I, I guess would be the best way to describe criminal and sex and sex criminals and uh you know i'm ed brubaker and uh and matt fraction come to mind and certainly what kirkman's doing with walking dead i mean this isn't your normal dc and marvel fair and a lot of independent creators going through image and going through some of the other publishers are finding success if you were talking about like you said top shelf fanographics first second is obviously a good example how are things going as a cartoonist approaching those uh those publishers um, well, see, I'm, I'm a weird case because because uh, with my WYSIWYG comic, I, I self published that for a while, and I made a like a lot of a lot of cash on that. Like I know I know how to traverse those waters. So for me, it's just fine. Like like uh, sure. it's no problem. Like whenever people ask me questions about industry or anything like that, yeah. Like I, I don't um I don't even think about that stuff because even if there was no comic industry, I know that like I have enough hustle in me. That I'm going to be okay uh, as a cartoonist. I'm going to be able to live and, and breathe as a cartoonist because I'll just do everything myself. I kind of prefer that anyhow. Um, like the the only reason I need a publisher is for just upfront capital because I don't have the balls to put in fifty thousand dollars of my own money. Sure. Um, but you know if if you trust me, like 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 uh, with with every other aspect, publicity, everything, uh, like. I will certainly make your money back, no problem. And, uh, you know, as a cartoonist, and, and the stuff that I like best is a singular vision. I, I want to see what's going on in one person's head. So, like, the more it gets diluted by, like, here's a writer, now here's a penciler, here's an inker, like, that's that's uh, less interesting to me. Um, so I want to see, like, one, like, a singular vision. And um, you, just, you just find more of that in these like more independent comics or whatever you call them boing boing dot net is uh going i mean i I, obviously that's a big site and everything uh you get good traffic for your stuff over there yeah yeah i mean uh, you know i'm i'm not so uh egotistical as to believe that um that my my book sold just because i'm so cool or something like that like like (laughs) uh boing boing gets about five million unique readers uh per month sure and you know even if one percent of that five million, take a look at my hip hop strips. Uh, you know that's uh, that's more numbers than than you know the print or you know, than than we see print. You know. Sure. Yeah, I, and I should. I mean, if you don't mind me asking, like, what kind of print runs are you doing for uh, Hip Hop Family Tree? Uh, just because I like talked about the stuff selling out and everything. Like, I just want to. I'm going to keep that to myself just because I don't want okay. people counting up my money and shit like that. You know hip, like low five figure, or you don't even want to go there. Uh, we'll say low five figure, man, because it's good. It's good if people think you're broke. All right, there you. <laughs> good for you, man. That's all right. Very cool. No, you know, honestly, I I, I only ask because um, I know a lot of uh, creators are, you know, they they do listen and they they are interested in how how guys are making it and whatever pro tips you know you guys are willing to pass along in terms of self publishing and and clearly you are you are you know hustling in the best sense of the word to to get your product out there. And, and get your shit out there. Good for you, man. Yeah, it's cool. Like the 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 audience that seems to exist for my thing is like a is like a tandem audience. It's it's people who already like comics, uh, so they're approaching my comic as just you know another comic, and they're learning a little bit about hip hop. And then there's this whole other audience, an untapped audience in comics of just people. Of just people who um, are hip hop fans, DJs, and all this kind of a thing, so they're falling into, you know, comics by way of my comic, uh, and you know, my thing's the, f- the first comic they've read in a-, a bunch of years, probably, and so they're willing to give other comics a shot too, and and it's just it's very, it's very cool, you know, like I um, you mentioned Chicago, like last year I got to go. Do you know about Chicago Ideas Week? I think it's either it just happened this past week. Yes, I do. Absolutely, um, I was there. Last tell tell people tell by all means you you describe Chicago Ideas Week. Now I don't know who the Maven character is that put this together, but basically it's it's a kind of a TED Talk experience yes. where they they fashion. So it's it goes on all week and. There are two-hour blocks of time devoted to different subjects, 
And within that two-hour block, they might have five or ten speakers give a 10, 15, 20-minute discussion about said subject matter. Mm-hmm. That's so right. last year uh, – off the top of your head, do you know the guy who, who puts that together? No, I, you know, I, I don't. I, I only know other uh, new media people and traditional media people that have appeared at it, you know, much in the same way that I really don't know specifically – Who's behind the TED Talks? But I, I'm hip with what you know they're doing and everything. Yeah. So so at TED Talks is a really good. That's a good comparison. Go on. Right. Yeah. So so last year I was a part of of the hip hop uh, block of time, uh, and so I got to got to come out there and, and speak about hip hop family trees, relation with with comics, and and um, it was a really great two hour session. But you know the amazing thing is that. You know, I'm a part of this thing, and they're putting me up in a on in a hotel on the same floor as Buzz Aldrin, the astronaut, <laughs> and and the guy who created PayPal, and you yes. know all this kind of. Stuff. And I'm like, yeah, man, comics are are hip, you know. Like like uh, I still have some of that old fanboy scar tissue, expecting people to be treated like a second class <laughs> citizen or something. Like, oh yeah, maybe they'll put me, the comic book dude, up at like the Motel Six, while uh, you know, the Winklevoss twins get get the penthouse suite at the Hilton or whatever. Uh, but no, nah, man, it was, it was democratic. Hey man, are you kidding me? You're going to be my guy that I'm going to be hitting up for my first Bitcoins. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> and it sounds, cause you're in the fast lane, man. You're already there. You're, and, and that's terrific. That's, that's excellent. And I'm glad to see that you're getting recognized by, by those kinds of circles of interesting uh, people that are creating these think tanks and, and letting people know about uh, the new avenues of where, Art is going, and science, and technology, and and the like, and I and no, that's that's fantastic, and I'm glad that you were a part of Chicago Ideas last year. That's wonderful. Yeah, I was just reading about what happened, uh, you know, just a couple, like you said, last week and everything. I tried I tried to sell them on uh, doing a, a, a comic graphic novel two hour block for this year, and a big part of my argument was just how rich with you know some of the greatest cartoonists of our generation like come from Chicago. You, um, Absolutely. You know, Dan Klaus, Chris Ware, Ivan Brunetti still there. Yes, sir. Uh, then there's the younger kids like Paul Hornschmeyer or Jeffrey Brown. Indeed. Uh, Laura Park is there. Um, so, like, that was my thing where I'm like, okay, let me, like, you don't even have to put these people up in a hotel room. You know, like, right, they're, here. They're, all, they're all here, but they just, they couldn't see it. You know, like, they, they, uh, you know, it's sort of lost out. Well, we're gonna have to work on them. That's true. And you know, uh, Printers Row. We gotta we gotta send the Chicago Ideas people to Printers Row. The Chicago Tribune uh, every year in June puts out a big big bookseller uh, event that happens all weekend. And the kind of stuff you see on well, nobody else is watching it. I think except me. But you know, they do it on C-SPAN too. That book TV on the weekends and stuff. And it's just, you know, really, it's, it's like a comic convention and stuff, but it's, it's all, you know, for regular, you know, novels and, and uh, nonfiction as well. And uh, th- luckily, you know, they're, they're smart enough to always have a good graphic novel presence at Printer's Row. We've got to hit you up. we got to get you with the Chicago Tribune people and let, let uh, you come up for that next time. Yeah, that, that'll be cool, man. I was just in a Barnes & Noble uh, earlier, and I saw that they put Hip Hop Family Tree in, in the – you know the regular graphic novel ghetto, but they but okay. they also put it in the performing arts section with with you know other like uh, you know my my book is right next to uh, a Bob Dylan book and I, I that, thought that was fantastic. You know, man, and I'm really glad you said that because that is exactly what I've been telling the crime comic people. I mean, that's that is the dream is that when when the booksellers really do just go by genre. And graphic novels absolutely deserve to be right next to traditional books, prose books, because as you say, you're getting your audience from the hip hop culture. They would love this stuff, and they just got to be made aware of it to want to purchase it. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why I'm glad you're here today and talking about it on War Balloon. And we can get, uh, you know, some of. The, I just had Tony Millionaire on last month, and we were talking about his great stuff. Jeffrey's been on before. Jeffrey Brown, you mentioned. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've certainly had Dean Haspiel and, and some others on, Drew Friedman. So I'm, I'm glad to uh, have you on, Ed, and talking about uh, the great stuff that you're doing, man. So, you know, one and two are available now. People can get them from uh, edpisker.com? Uh, no, but you could get them at Amazon or, or any, okay. any good bookstore. 
are you selling them at Boing Boing or no? Um, there, on Boing Boing, there's a link to the Amazon page, but you can go to like the, okay. the Fanagraphics page. Um, it's it's Great. accessible, and like I said, there are two places to find it in Barnes and Noble. Do you have a game plan? I mean, Volume Two did just come out two months ago. It came out in August. Yep. Um, is uh, is there a game plan for? Uh, for uh, volume three, or I uh, just when it's done, then you'll then you'll release volume three. There, there's a game plan. Uh, it's basically going to be an an annual book to come out every every summer. So early early August is probably okay. when uh, book three will come out. Um, okay. But you know there there are a lot of opportunities that that come by, a lot of things that happen that um, might might push the date back a little bit here and there. Like I've been offered a lot of uh, teaching work. Uh, Terrific. You know, in early 2015, so I'm going to be in Denmark for two weeks teaching a workshop at a university. Wow! Uh, then then I come home for like three days, and then I go to Gainesville, Florida, to uh, uh, cartoonists uh, Leela Corman and Tom Hart have have a an institution called Saw S A W Sequential Art Workshop or something like that. And okay, teaching a workshop in Gainesville, Florida for a week. So that takes time away from the strip, you know, because each each two-page strip that I do for Hip Hop Family Tree is a seven-day operation, you know. So when my attention is diverted, like then that strip just you know can't happen that day, that week. Understood. And they've been they've been nice, meaty uh, collections too, man. I mean, you know, we're talking over a hundred pages, like about one hundred and twelve pages. Yeah, each of those books is the culmination of uh, you know a year of my life, like, like three hundred sixty-five days of my life, or like. You know, on on paper, right there, man. There are there are no sick days uh, in comics uh, in this way, you know. So, so uh, you know, they in every sense of the word, they're they're an annual. That's excellent, man. No, they're they're really terrific. Hip Hop Family Tree, I highly recommend them, and I and I really appreciate uh, you coming on today. You know, you said you were just at Ape. Are there are there any other uh, comic conventions that you're going to be doing? Yeah. Um, in starting November seventh, I'm going to be on another tour. I'm going to be all over the place. I'm starting in Seattle. There's a convention called Jet City, I believe. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be. I'm going to be there. Um, I'm going to be at Vancouver, a, a Vancouver Comic Con. Terrific. Um, on the 18th, I'm doing a bookstore thing in LA uh, at Meltdown. Comics, terrific, excellent. And then, I believe the twenty first, I'm doing something at uh, City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco. Love that place. Um, and then it's going to be Miami Book Festival, and then and then I'm home. So I'm like I'm like on the road for like fifteen or sixteen days. Um, but it's going to be awesome. When you're at Meltdown, are you, do you have any podcast plans? You know, that's a that's a big podcast hub. Yeah, for sure. Um, Mark Frauenfelder from from uh, Boing Boing is going. We're going to have like a conversation, like in store, and Terrific. and that's uh, usually that's that's recorded. Um, so that's that's like the big thing that that. But you know, I'm basically just going to be in there for a day. Like like uh, Fana is. Fanographics is running me ragged, man. So I'm like in all of the cities for like one day. The the, the, uh, the one girl when she's booking my my travels, um, you know, I was like landing in Miami, and then you know landing at night, so I have like time to eat and go to sleep, and then I was going to do two panels, and then go to the airport and fly home, and I'm like, you can't get one extra hotel day for me, man, to just kind of kind of cool out a little like like you're gonna run me like that man you might take a year off my life like like, like don't you want more comics <laughs> i'll give you more comics if you like give me extra time on my lifespan <laughs> well try and rest up yeah drink a lot of fluid man i, mean, I sound like your mother now but uh that's great man uh, c- congratulations i think this is really uh this is a great annual, and I'm glad that you're doing it. Um, and and people can see your progress then online. Um, every single page is online, so so you could see every page of book three. Like if you read book one and two, you can read the progress of book three online. Right there at Boing. Okay, very cool. Yeah, so people can go to boingboing.net and check out uh, Ed's progress on volume three. People, you, when you when you check this out, you're not going to be disappointed, and it's going to make you want to buy these books. The Hip Hop Family Tree. 
uh, from Ed Pisker. Volumes 1 and 2 are available now, and he's in the midst of Volume 3. He's got a heavy tour date coming up. I hope you come to Chicago uh, again. I know you were just here last year, but I hope you'll uh, make plans. And when you do, I hope you'll let me know. Yeah, yeah, I, I would I would love to, man. Like, I had such a good time. When, when I was there for Chicago Ideas Week, uh, Peter Bagg was there doing, doing a presentation at Quimby's. So I, I jetted over there, checked out the presentation, cool. kicked it with Laura, Laura Park, who's one of my favorite cartoonists. It was like a, a great shy town night. Excellent, man. So, yeah. All right. All right. Well, if you can handle hanging out with a square, I'll, I'll, I'll be available. <laughs> that was Ed Pisker from 2014, my first conversation with him regarding uh, hip-hop family comics. Uh, as a postscript, I'd like to quote a good friend of mine, uh, B. Clay Moore who made a very good comment regarding this situation. From his Facebook page, this is B. Claymore from about six hours ago, as I'm recording this. We need to address how eager we are to publicly comment on situations and to condemn people in reports on their behaviors when we don't have direct first-hand knowledge. There's no need to cater to the why haven't people commented to this crowd when real people are involved, and we don't know exactly what people are dealing with. No one needs to apologize for anyone else's behavior, and no one needs to prove their own piety by condemning someone based on allegations. No one needs to be judged for not sharing an opinion on the behaviors of other people anyway. And if you find yourself celebrating the downfall or comeuppance of someone in the arts that you don't know and have had no interactions based with, uh, interactions with based solely on your perceptions of them from a distance, The best idea is to keep it to yourself. A friend of mine put it well when he said, turning strangers into monsters so we can slay them online is a societal cancer that hurts everyone. How many people do you actually know well enough to condemn? And while it's true that you can't really assign blame when someone does something as drastic as take their own life when the world collapses on top of them and social media is fueling that collapse, we seem to have generated and perpetuated a system that, is easy, that easily contributes to pushing someone off that cliff when they are already teetering on the edge. As I said at the beginning of the show, mental health is a very serious issue. If you know somebody who needs that help, do everything you can to stop them from doing the worst. Thanks for listening to Word Balloon. Uh, we'll get back to the nonsense on the next episode. <laughs>